Britain is a country haunted by its past. It is possessed by the memory of a golden age, a time long ago when this country was the most powerful on earth. This is a film about what happens when politicians summon up that romantic vision. For a moment it gives them immense power, but then they discover they have invoked forces they cannot control. The price they pay is to become imprisoned by their dream. They and the British people find themselves trapped by their history. The story begins in 1941, in a castle in Nazi Germany. I belong to Kolitz, dear old Kolitz Schloss. Kolditz was Germany's most secure prisoner of war camp. No one had ever escaped. But one young captain was determined to try. His name was Airy Neve. Neve was in fact taking part in this review in the camp theatre, uh, so called. And the idea was that Neve should go from under the stage into a passage which the Germans didn't know existed, and then Neve was to go down in German uniform, down through the guard room, and march out past one, two, three gates and sentries. An ambitious program, uh, which they did successfully. Neve became a hero, but he was just one of many legendary figures imprisoned in Kolditz. They included the fighter pilot, Douglas Bader, and the man who founded the SAS, Colonel David Sterling. All of them were trying to get back to the Britain they knew and loved. Underneath the arches, I dream my dreams away. Underneath the arches, on cobblestones I lay. Most of the people at Coldhill, this is sheer snobbery, uh, were either regular officers or territorial officers, most of whom had been at public schools and had had they were used to cold showers and beatings and that sort of thing. And the sort of Britain that we wanted to go back to was the old-fashioned Britain, which had Union Jacks and an empire and stability and order and decency and all that sort of thing. Sleeping when it's rain. What's that on your shoulder? What, this? Yes. It's a Greek earth. What's a Greek earth? Oh, I know, about 30 bob a week, I mean. Great. In the years after the war, Kolditz became a powerful symbol of British heroism in the face of overwhelming odds. Thirty years later, those heroic values were reawakened in an unexpected way. By the early 70s, Britain had become a country torn by industrial strife. Airy Neve was an eminent backbench Tory MP. He was respected for his gallant war record and for serving as a lawyer at the Nuremberg Trials. He believed the Britain he had fought for was being destroyed. During that period, the 70s, um, Airy Neve undoubtedly felt, as many of us did of that generation at that time in the House of Commons, that the values which saw us through the war were slipping away in the same sense as it was all under threat when we fought our war. I think the thing was that we'd been through a war and I think we could see the dangers more easily than those who hadn't. I, think, that's I think this true. was the thing, really. I think this is why perhaps we were more prominent than others, trying to uh, make people realize that these were very real dangers which existed. Neve was not alone. Many of his generation had a romantic picture of Britain. Its history was somehow different from the rest of the world. This Britain, they were convinced, had to be defended. Well, we knew that uh, Great Britain uh, had led the world morally. We had always been the moral leaders of the world, I think. And our values were the right values. And it seemed to us that uh, the wrong values were being imposed. In other words, thuggery instead of common sense and things like that. And we wanted to combat it. Some of the Colditz generation even set up private militias a network of retired military officers who would take over the running of the country if law and order collapsed. I think it has to 
be available just as, as we had a home guard during my war. We need people there to fight or do whatever is necessary, build boats, drive cars or trains, but be available in any form of emergency. <laughs> In October 1974, Edward Heath lost the second general election of that year. Labour was now firmly in power, committed to creating a socialist Britain. Airy Neave believed that this would finally destroy the Britain he believed in. He decided to fight. The first step would be to take over the Conservative Party. It was his patriotic duty. I think I came to this conclusion after October 1974. I went to Heath, uh, Mr. Heath myself and explained the position to him. Uh, we'd been friends for a number of years. I said that uh, I felt that uh, there should be a change of leadership uh, and uh, that I would be associated with any election uh, program that might take place with regard to candidates for the opposition. He really uh, wanted uh, to get rid of Ted Heath as the leader. So uh, he looked around for someone who was the opposite of Ted Heath. and. Uh, he, without any great hope that it would work the first time round, uh, picked on Margaret. I, I've never been very good at pushing myself in matters of this kind. And just out of the blue, Ellie came to me one day in the House of Commons and said, um, have you got anyone organising your campaign? I said, good heavens, no. Organising it? You don't push yourself. It's a matter for other people. And he said, well, I think I'd better take it over then, don't you? And I said, well, I'd be delighted. Just like that. Now, I understand that you ran a very discreet uh, campaign, what's been described as a kind of Colditz campaign on behalf of uh, Mrs. Thatcher, so that Mr. Heath's camp didn't really know what had hit them until it was too late. Is that true? I think it's entirely true. Uh, I think it was very important with a new candidate uh, when the establishment of the Conservative Party were... Um, organizing in support of the leader, which was very proper for them to do, that I should run a very discreet campaign among the backbenches. And we did this quietly and discreetly. It resembles Colditz in the sense that one had to be careful what one was doing. She won it. And on the second ballot, she won it. By which time, she and Erin Eve had become great friends. But he was another kind of, uh, not an icon figure exactly, but totally sympathetic to her political philosophy. I, uh, sorry, yeah. Now, I suspect what he saw is something very close to, again, the values which we've been trying to describe. Margaret Thatcher was someone who appreciated the greatness of this country and believed in it. Airy Nee felt uh, that she held the same views of patriotism which he believed in himself. I think he saw that in her. And he was right. For me, there is no choice. I do not intend to be the first woman prime minister of a mediocre and declining Britain. <laughs> and I do intend to be its first woman prime minister. Mrs. Thatcher took over a demoralized Tory party. The modern Britain the Conservatives had tried to build in the 50s and 60s had collapsed. In its place, she offered a new vision. She too would modernise the economy and make it grow. But the wealth produced would recreate an older form of Britain. She promised to recapture a time when this country and its people were great. I think it's essentially a matter of recapturing an imagined past. She had an ideal. The the tools, the machinery to produce this were very modern economic ideas. And she simply applied them. But at the heart of the whole enterprise was this romantic idea of what Britain should be. Our armed forces stood alone against the mightiest army the world had ever seen. We made a part political broadcast in 1978, which was called Going Backwards or Forwards. 
And the, the idea was that as a result of, of the way the country had been governed for the previous years, uh, Britain had gone backwards in its achievements, whereas in its past it had gone forward. And that if we could bring the past into the future, into the present, then we could go forward ourselves. We reversed the film so that the things that had been achievements became failures. And because it pays people not to work, today less and less is made in Britain. We pay our armed forces less. Instead of fighting for the country, they're fighting fires or emptying dustbins. In a word, Britain is going backwards. And the argument was that if we could bring the glories of the past into the present and, and gain the economic strength that the past had had, then we had a chance of regaining the glories of the past in the present day. Her vision was of a great Britain that had always respected authority and discipline, uh, a hierarchical Britain, a Britain where people did what they were told and where the uh, benefit was that you could hold your uh, head up in the world. It is a view of history, it's not by any means the only one, because it's, only, it's a view of history that has only really been in the interests of a tiny minority of powerful people. Her intention was to take Britain back to roughly where it was at the beginning of the 19th century. Mrs Thatcher's vision of what actually constituted the glories of Britain in the 19th century came largely from one source. She was inspired by Winston Churchill and his version of British history. Her idea of what the past constituted was very much influenced by Churchill. So she took on more or less holus bolus Churchill's view of great, as in Great Britain. And she used to play those Churchill tapes, sound tapes, quite regularly. She used to refer to him as Winston, as though he was an old friend and mate. But that's the way she thought of him, you see. Churchill exercised a powerful, almost mesmeric hold, not just on Mrs. Thatcher, but on many of her generation who had grown up in the war. In 1940, he had captivated them with a series of radio broadcasts that gave a romantic picture of their island story. In 1940, Churchill was able to conjure up a vision of Britain and British history and the British Empire, which was his and was completely sincere. And in a strange way, he was able to convince us all that we were indeed the inheritors of the great traditions of the past and that it was a privilege for us to play a part, however minor, in this great drama which he was creating for us. This ordeal by fire has, in a certain sense, even exhilarated the manhood and the womanhood of Britain. All are proud of being under the fire of the enemy. This indeed is the grand heroic period of our history and the light of glory shines on all. Churchill had invoked this bright, heroic image of Britain's history to rally his people at a time when the country faced almost certain defeat. But in doing so, he led the British people into a world of his own imagining. They were drawn by the power of his imagination into an idealized vision of Britain's past. A dream of a world that was long gone. He subordinated reason, effectively, to the heroic myth. The glory, I think, was, was there, but the reality behind it, the, the reality behind the glory of, of the Queen's Jubilee, Queen Victoria's Jubilee, or Edward VII's coronation, that was irrecoverable because that was based on material and military strength that had all been spent. He, he was imprisoned by a vision at the same time as he was inspired by it. 
When he took over in 1940, Churchill was faced in cabinet by hard-headed politicians like the Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax. Halifax and many other ministers believed Churchill to be a dangerous fantasist. He was deluding the British people into thinking they were still great. But Churchill was convinced that the only way to win the war was to inspire the people with a vision of their greatness. It could be argued that, that um, it was a con trick. There, there were sophisticated people who said this is all hot air, but I tell you, the, the mass of the people, it was an extraordinary experience. So we entered his dream. But there were parts of Britain's history that did not fit into Churchill's dream, nor into Mrs. Thatcher's. They were about to intrude violently into the heart of her world. Chris Patton and I were working on uh, a speech for her in the room actually overlooking the, the car park. It was in the uh, opposition leader's set of rooms. And uh, we were working away, and there was a sudden bang, and I looked up, and, and Chris said, uh, I think that was a bomb. And I said, oh, I don't think so. It was probably a car backfiring. Well, it was a car, but it wasn't backfiring. Chris pulled the curtains too rapidly. I said, don't go near the curtains, it is a bomb. No one knew who it was, but then they checked the, the uh, registration number. And of course, it turned out to be Airy. She wasn't there at the time. She'd been off opening a fate somewhere out of London. As soon as you could get me, I've got two minutes here. Someone being killed in a bomb accident. I'm coming to talk to you. Just now, seven minutes ago, I was talking. We don't know yet. Terrible news, Mrs. Thatcher. I don't know about it, Jim. I'm just going to be in. All we know is that it's one day. I'm just going to talk to you. I'll come up. 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 The political wing of the INLA was the Irish Republican Socialist Party. Neve would have been a person of, uh, um, who would have been perceived to have been a, cons a considerable threat and would have, seen, would have been perceived to have been somebody of, uh, if he had ever become Secretary of State, would have transformed the situation. A person who was saying things about the Irish people, about internment, about, um, about bringing back the death penalty for people engaged in what he called terrorist acts in Ireland. Then, of course, he suddenly became a person of some significance in Ireland. He appeared, anyway, on the, on the face of it, to represent that, that, that new force in, 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 in the Tory party, that kind of reactionary view of a lower middle class losing its base of support, losing its power, um, attempting to grasp again that element of power that it felt it should have had, that it perhaps felt it was entitled to after the Second World War, um, which was, um, which I think perhaps Margaret Thatcher certainly represented, and uh, and perhaps manifested itself to some degree in this new heroic figure that uh, that was presented to um, the Irish people in the shape of Erin Neve. You know, people remember him for a lot of things, perhaps most of all for the fact that he got out of coal bits. They don't remember him so much for the many kindnesses he did. Really a person, a wonderful person, of tremendous inner strength. And just one more thing, some devils got him. And they must never, never, never be allowed to triumph. They must never prevail. Those of us who believe in the things that Airy fought for must see that our views 
are the ones which continue to live on in this country. Airy Neve was buried at Abinger in Berkshire, in the heart of the English countryside. Six weeks later, Mrs Thatcher won the general election, and the following week a memorial service was held for Airy Neve. In her address, Mrs. Thatcher promised to rebuild the Britain he had fought for in the war. And it was quite extraordinary. Here was this rather frail-looking, pale-looking young woman who had become Prime Minister and had become a successor to all these people and who went up into the pulpit and made this address. It was a very extraordinary occasion because it, uh, I felt at the time, well, there are so many things that this country has always been good at which have fallen away and we no longer occupy the kind of position in the world that warrants them being said. But this, the way she did it, somehow I thought, we still do that kind of thing better than any other country. And it was very moving. And this was right at the beginning of her premiership. The night of the victory in 1709, she was entirely emotional. She had found her moment. She had this very powerful and very romantic, in the strict sense of the word, view of what her country had been and how she was going to remake it. And so you think a penny off here means a penny off there. Just enlarge your ideas of what this country can do. One of Mrs. Thatcher's aims was to generate a new sense of pride in Britain's past. For over 30 years, monuments to the country's greatness had lain discarded. They had been replaced by modern sculpture. Now that was all to change. Her supporters took up the challenge. One evening, I was uh, standing on one of the uh, gates just over there, and uh, I wondered why we have a spotlight on King George V when a man, I think, of national importance down in the square should have the same treatment. Sir Winston Churchill. Bearing in mind he was the right man in the right place at the right time. And I thought, well, this is definitely not on. Hello? And the next thing I know, I've got a letter in my tray saying, you know, well done. I think your idea is brilliant and all this business, or worse to that effect. And, um, hey presto, the light appeared. It was all due to you? Well, yes, I, I think yes, I think it was, definitely. Um, well, it was, there's was no, it was no, it was no question about it. So Winston Churchill had 13 models made in his lifetime. Are you anticipating to have lots more sittings for new models? Well, I hope so. This is number two. It's better than number one. Mrs. Thatcher quickly established herself as a new kind of leader, driven by a messianic vision. But her party didn't realize the price the country would have to pay to be reborn in her terms. By 1981, the inner cities were torn by riots. Unemployment was nearing three million. Those at the top of the Conservative Party were convinced that Mrs. Thatcher's policies risked destroying both their party and the country. Well, the country was in massive economic decline. Huge interest rates, huge inflation rate, massive unemployment rising all the time. Pay rises out of control. Um, the unions still very strong um, and causing strikes all over the place. <clears throat> Making massively unreasonable demands. Um, she was, she'd done two years. She was visited by the men in grey suits who said, well, this was a jolly nice experiment and you were, after all, the first woman prime minister, but it's not really worked, has it? Why don't you clear off? Um, and she became very isolated for the first time. What she thought in 1981 was that if she lost the battle of the budget that year, all her dreams, all her hopes would have failed. So she stuck to it. And I remember her at the time, again and again, repeating almost like a mantra, Churchill in 1940. Churchill in 1940. Churchill in 1940. 
The moment in 1940 to which Mrs Thatcher looked for inspiration was a meeting at which Churchill defeated his critics in Cabinet. It happened at the end of May. The German armies were pushing the British back towards Dunkirk. Halifax and other ministers wanted to make a deal with Hitler, but Churchill was determined to fight on. He called a meeting of the whole government, including the junior ministers. He made a sweeping romantic speech. Any idea of negotiation now seemed unworthy of the destiny of a great nation. And he gave them a terrific uh, tirade, and using all the emotive language that in cabinet just made people look away in embarrassment, and about how if we will fight till we choke on our own blood and things like that. These are, the records of this meeting are about minting a few phrases, many, minting many phrases, which he was later to use to great effect in public. And he um, got a unanimous standing ovation support from them. Methinks I see in my mind a mighty and puissant nation rousing herself like a strong man after sleep and shaking her invincible lock. Methinks I see her as an eagle, mewing her mighty youth, kindling her undazzled eyes at the full midday beam, purging and unscaling her long-abused sight at the fountain itself of heavenly radiance. And the irony is that Churchill delivered the breathing space. He delivered the victories, but because he'd done it, by invoking this a special myth that gave a, a kind of impregnability to, to the ideas, and no one could question them. He and we were still lumbered with this myth, which is the very romantic vision of, uh, of our past and how it had to be projected into our future. Still today, it is a treason to question these arguments. I don't want to listen to the, to the arguments. The myth is what counts. In July 1981, Mrs. Thatcher called a full cabinet meeting. Against opposition from most of her ministers, she insisted they pursue the new economic policies. If they didn't, the glorious Britain she had promised to create would be lost forever. She knew that she did not have the full trust of the cabinet, but she fought it through nonetheless and she invented a consensus of the nation, the junior ministers, the backbenchers, all of whom she thought shared her vision of what England had been and could be. All this was inspired by her childhood reading of Churchill. She was in a dream world. Mrs. Thatcher had overwhelmed her opponents by summoning up a romantic vision of the past. But such was the power of her dream that she also raised other ghosts, the ghosts of Ireland's history, which was inextricably linked with that of Britain. We found, in the Republican movement, we found it was much easier to oppose and to fight uh, Mrs. Thatcher than it was with uh, Ted Heath or indeed Harold Wilson and so on because uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher uh, appeared the personification of all that had gone before of, 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 of English tyranny as it was in Ireland. Say hello to the trouble. Lloyd George and Churchill sent the Black and Tans to Ireland. And this was Churchill back again, and that he was no friend of Ireland or of the Irish people. She seemed to bring up all that type of thing again. She must have known what she was doing, or did she? In March 1981, Republican prisoners began a hunger strike in support of their claim for political status. 
Mrs Thatcher refused any concessions. The resulting conflict brought two powerful versions of British history into direct opposition. History played an enormously important motivating role, I think, for the people who went on the hunger strike. And they, I think, individually found themselves in a situation of actually carrying, just by pure chance, just because of the historical circumstances, especially historical, of having to carry the weight of that history and to, to honour it, that somehow the current of history passed to them. And I think that I think they would have, all of them, individually felt that and that that's why they made the decisions they made. Sands, Bobby, anti-H block, Armour, political prisoner, 30,000... Yeah! Bobby Sands, the hunger strikers' leader, was elected to Westminster on a wave of public sympathy. It was the beginning of Sinn Féin as a modern political party. Four weeks later, Bobby Sands died. But Mrs Thatcher refused to negotiate. After nine more deaths, the strike was called off. Mrs Thatcher had won. But she paid a price for her victory. The powerful historical forces she had summoned up in Ireland were not under her control. And suddenly, um, she was confronted by, um, by people that she didn't think very much of, that she didn't consider very important or very significant, that didn't figure at all in her understanding of the priorities uh, facing her at, at any particular moment in time. And suddenly, she's confronted by history, if you like, a very real history, one represented by the Irish perception of history. Mrs. Thatcher, if you like, in, in stage managing all this kind of thing, uh, actually played into the hands of the Republican movement at the time. She disturbed some very unquiet ghosts. Suddenly, in 1982, the ghosts of Britain's grand imperial past returned. On April the 2nd, Argentina invaded the Falklands. Within hours, the British Chiefs of Staff came to number 10. They proposed that Mrs Thatcher send a fleet of ships and men to recapture the islands. In fact, it was Sir Henry Leach, I think, who was the first Lord of the Admiralty, who said to her, well, Prime Minister, I can only tell you, if you don't do it, this country will never be quite the same country again. And that went right like an arrow through her. But she sent the task force, she got the task force together, and she sent it that day. It was a marvellous moment for her. She did it in a truly Churchillian manner. And she took the tie, just as Churchill did, against all the play-safe people in the cabinet, people who'd been conditioned in the whole ethic of appeasement and compromise and didn't think we were strong enough to do it. And they were just outnumbered. The, 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 the flow of public feeling rushed over them because she invoked it immediately. As the fleet sailed out from Portsmouth, the warships passed over divers, working to recover the wreck of the Mary Rose. Henry VIII's great wooden flagship had sunk in a battle with the French over 400 years before. The recovery teams were based in the naval dockyards. When we were going out to the site from the naval base, uh, we go past the hot walls, the defensive gun battery that controls the entrance to the harbour, and there were the wives and the mothers waving the ships goodbye. It was terribly emotional, terribly, terribly, terribly highly strung. I thought I'd never see such a thing in England again. I was incredibly surprised that I felt so emotional and so passionately in support of the people who were going, because it seemed we were almost fighting an old-fashioned war, to me personally. But I was probably terribly wrong in that judgment, but it seemed to me it was an old-fashioned war. We were back with the invasion force, which was my last memory of war, my last personal memory. Oh, 
I think the Falklands was something which Mr. Galtieri, he needed a good smack in the teeth, as I think, as he think we were going to uh, sit around scratching ourselves. Uh, we had our national pride to think of, and I think this is where Margaret Thatcher came into her own in making a decision to go there and teach him a lesson he wasn't going to forget. <laughs> that the White Ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. What happens next? What's it on? Thank you, Ramsay. Just your rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. She whipped round and, and said, rejoice, rejoice. You know, like an absolute, it was like a tornado sweeping in and then practically, you know, I could see them start back. It was extraordinary. Uh, she had this power then. She could see herself as Churchill. On the 14th of June, a ceasefire was announced on the Falklands. The Argentine troops surrendered to the British. Hello and welcome to South Sea Castle for what promises to be the most remarkable archaeological event that we in this country are ever likely to see. The raising and homecoming of the Tudor warship, the Mary Rose. At the time of the recovery, in the public eye, there was a close association and the two things, the Falklands returning of a fleet, the successful return of the task force and the recovery of the Mary Rose were inescapably interwoven. What we were bringing back, I think, was the intense feeling that we're an island and we've defended an island for centuries. There, there is the wreck of the Mary Rose. It has come to the surface. There is the first sight of this flagship of Henry VIII. It's the first time we have seen this in 437 years. A wonderful moment. You hear all the sirens ringing, and I should think probably the Navy will get in on the act. It has. I have no regrets. I have no regrets. We had to send that task force. We had to regain those islands for our people. Regrets is a chapter of pride for our country. In November 1982, a victory parade was held in the city of London. Mrs. Thatcher and the chiefs of staff took the salute. None of the royal family was present. A lot of the British people then realised that we could hold our heads up again and that we could be strong in the world. I mean, it was an extraordinary achievement, this, 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 uh, this flotilla going across the world, taking six weeks to get there and then boffing them and coming back again. Um, I mean, I think that's, the, that's, that's a British-type achievement. Is it very, very it's, heavy? No, it's not heavy. This is all in porcelain. <clears throat> the quality of the work is superb. Look above all at the expression on the faces of the Marines. It is the spirit of Britain, and it is everything that makes us great. She brought back, I think, something which a lot of people thought that they'd never see again. She was giving the country back their pride. Great back in Great Britain. Our history is special in as much that everyone's tried to give us a good hiding since the year dot. The Romans uh, failed, I think, really miserably. They, they didn't really succeed in conquering the whole of England. We, the British people, are proud of what has been done. Proud of these heroic pages in our island story. Proud to be here today to salute the task force. Proud to be British. She was on a high after the Falklands, of course, and capitalised on it to great effect. 
Uh, later, just as Churchill did, she was to some extent entrapped by it. And that is always the danger that of politicians who, who drink from this potion. It's very difficult to know when to stop. It is an intoxicating mixture, and the usual consequence of intoxication is that you want more of the same. In May 1983, Mrs. Thatcher called a general election. Every morning, the journalists were played martial music to emphasize the theme of the campaign. A new kind of Britain had been forged in the South Atlantic, one capable of rallying to the flag with confidence and moral righteousness. She had been correct to take Britain down the road to the past. Oh, back then? Mm. Oh, I think we thought it would never stop. I think we thought that um, those of us who were very close to her thought that, that she had done something that would go on and that, uh, that, it, that we would prosper and we'd have low taxes and we'd have low inflation and we would hold our heads high and we'd be a dominant force in the world. <clears throat> we would dominate a free market Europe. We would have, maintain the, the, the old traditional alliance with the Americans. We would establish proper links with the Commonwealth and that we would have a, a joyous and economic, prosperous and, and dominant future. We brought back the things that had made Britain great in the past. I, really did, I think we really believed that. We really thought this was here to stay. What do you think of Mrs. Thatcher? Marvellous! Best man in England. The only leader that can bring us back to normality in this country. We need a firm, a determined leader like Mrs. Thatcher to take our country back to an era where we all, you and I, we held our heads high as British. In our time, I don't know whether Carol would agree with this, there have been two great prime ministers and only two, Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher. Yes, this is absolutely, I would absolutely go along with that. Um, because she did things w against the advice of everyone. For a period, a certain ascendancy was established over people, and history played a part in winning that ascendancy for her, because people felt it was inevitable, it was natural, it was normal, this is what life was about, this is what we've all been waiting for, this would deal with the unruly marble, would cause such a lot of trouble. I think that's really what she was doing. She reconstructed from Churchill, or from her understanding of Churchill, a whole sense of a separate British identity that was not collectivist but individualist. And this is what she thought he believed in, not wholly inaccurately, but perhaps a little fancifully. And that's what we, you and I, live with now. We're living in her version of Churchill's version of British history. But it's a dream. Of course. All dreams are in some sense, remember your Freud, reality. we have today, in fact all week, we have a Saxon travelling village set in the ninth century and people can wander around and they can have a look at spinning and they can have a look at uh, soldiers uh, guarding the camp and skills at arms and they can see various activities that would have taken place in the ninth century, which frankly you just don't see anymore. In 1984, Mrs Thatcher set up English Heritage. One of its aims was to bring the past to life. It organised historical reenactments of great moments from British history. We don't actually do many Second World War events because it's a bit close to home. There's still people who lost loved ones in the Second World War and frankly we think it's a little bit tasteless to run around shooting each other on a battlefield. Uh, Make-believe, if you like, when it really happened. It is a matter of taste, really, and, and we believe that uh, history at, at a, a safe historical distance is, is rather better than something which can still cause personal pain to people.
In the mid-80s, an intense mood of nostalgia swept Britain. Whole new towns were built, faithfully reproducing the world of a hundred years before. They were constructed on land left empty by the industrial closures of the past five years. Those who had once worked in the factories and the mines found themselves acting out the lives of their ancestors. In 1974, there had been 800 museums. Now there were 2,000. Mrs. Thatcher instructed the architect, Quinlan Terry, to reconstruct the interior of Downing Street as an exact copy of how it had been in the 18th century. She lived above this perfectly restored world in the attic. It is a homely room, actually. It's a homely flat. You know, it's not a grand flat, as you can see, we're up in the attic. Uh, this is where the staff used to live many, many years ago. But we love it. Yes, we do feel up at home here. Well, at weekends, it's just terribly quiet. No vision of history is wholly real. What Churchill liked to do was select from history as he'd read it the glorious moments. The same is true of Margaret Thatcher in that her vision of the past was very imaginative. Any politician who tries to use history almost invariably doesn't get it quite right. But what drives them on is what bits they select. For six hours this morning, southern Britain was battered by the worst storms the nation has known for nearly three centuries. They came in from the ocean without any warning from the weathermen. The winds were those of a hurricane. I heard a, a type of whistling noise, a very eerie noise, and the sky was incredible colours, although it was the middle of the night. It, just, it wasn't black, it was, it was kind of orange glow. And at first light, I opened my front door and the forest had just completely gone and there was a horizon where one hadn't been for about 300 years. The gardens of the historic houses and we're surrounded by them in this area, all of them were absolutely devastated and it was as if the whole of the past of English history had been wiped away in just a few hours. Then, four days later, an event occurred that challenged the very foundations of Mrs. Thatcher's vision of a new Great Britain. Monday turned out to be a watershed. We came in not really knowing what to expect after the hurricane and everything else, and we simply stared at the screens all day, watching the Sea of Red, as it was named, watching financial prices falling. And realising that the British people had simply lost control over their economy. In the 80s, Mrs. Thatcher had freed the financial markets from any controls. Her aim was to transform the city into the powerhouse of the New Britain. But the effect was to help create a global system of currency dealing in which national boundaries became irrelevant. When the markets panicked, as they did on Black Monday, there was nothing the government could do to stop them. Mrs. Thatcher had lost control of her country's destiny. The significance of Black Monday was quite simply that we had all been led to believe that Mrs. Thatcher was in control of events. A lot of us suspected that perhaps that was an exaggeration. It was clear that she was trying to cover up a lot of the cracks with a lot of rhetoric. We had to accept the logic of the market, which was quite simply that there was no longer any entity uh, which we could reasonably and realistically call the great British economy. Do you think she knew that? I suspect that towards the end, with the kind of problems which emerged at the end, uh, she began to suspect that perhaps she had been chasing an illusion, yes. To 
towards the end of the Second World War, Churchill came to realise that the reality behind his dream of a great imperial Britain was fading. The price the country had paid for standing alone against Hitler was to bankrupt itself. He had invoked a dream, only to see the last remnants of it destroyed. Churchill was beginning to fade a little. I know that he was very conscious that he no longer wielded the real power. That was being wielded by the United States. They had overtaken us. When they first came into the war, we were the predominant power, even from a military point of view. Roosevelt wanted to bring the British Empire to an end. They made no bones about it. The Americans believed that Churchill's underlying aim in the war was to recapture Britain's lost imperial glory. It was a plan to restore the world the Prime Minister loved the most, the 19th century world of unabashed great power politics. The Americans would have none of it. Increasingly, they excluded Churchill from discussions on the shape of the post-war world. Britain's power was over. I suppose very reluctantly and very privately, he realised that we no longer disposed of the strength, even on the scale with which we disposed of it when the war started. It was a pretty bleak prospect for him. The appearance of glory was all there. You know, the sitting in the chairs and the cavalcade and the saluting sentries and so on. That was magnificent. But underneath it, the whole thing had been washed away. Around that time, there was a sort of private lunch that, that uh, I was invited to down at Chequers. It was the most beautiful day, rather like today. Uh, birds singing in the trees, and this was an English garden, if ever there was one. And um, really, the, the idea that you could feel that anything was wrong, or whatever would be wrong, was alien to the atmosphere of that particular afternoon. I suddenly saw her sitting on a sofa quite apart from everybody else, looking again with a sort of strange look, where she was sort of peering into the, into the distance, into the future, and seeing something that uh, uh, was not attractive to her. Security was very, very tight at that time. Um, the IRA had become even more serious threats, and so she was constantly protected from mixing with ordinary people the way she used to. Um, Downing Street had become a bunker. Um, the fight with the cabinet was intense. You'd had these big, big um, um, uh, resignations by Lawson and and, uh, and Howe and so on. The problem is that the effect of the poll tax was to make people, ordinary folk, appear to be the enemy. The very people whose nerves she touched and who had voted her into power. In 1990, Mrs Thatcher was finally forced to resign as Prime Minister. A majority within the Conservative Party had decided that her time was past. Her policies were tearing the party and Great Britain apart. I think that Margaret Thatcher's best speech was on the last knockings of her reign as Premier in the House when she said, to hell with all this, you're going to get both barrels. And it was a lovely sight to see. And that's when I realised that I was seeing a Rolls Royce leave the scene of, of politics and uh, maybe would never see the likes of it again in my lifetime. So, there we are. I'm enjoying this. It seemed to me at the time, almost like a Greek tragedy. But here was a woman who, for a, a brief time, had uh, held the world in her hands, or at least held this country's world in her hands. And she felt that it was all slipping away. The dream continued virtually to the end, and in my opinion, it was when she 
lost contact with the dream, that she lost contact with reality. I know where I've seen him. A picture. There's a picture of him. A miniature in a cracked glass in the attic. I'll show you. It can't be. It can't be. You know him. But you said... Yes, Miss, you see, he's dead. Underneath the arches, I dream my dreams away. Underneath the arches, on cobblestones I lay. Is my, my wife's gone to the West Indies. Your wife's gone to the West Indies. That's right. Jamaica? No, she went to her own accord. Now it's time for a new chapter to open. And I wish John Major all the luck in the world. He'll be splendidly served. And he has the makings of a great prime minister. As the war drew to a close, Churchill came to realize that the power his romantic vision of history gave him was gone. One night in despair, he said to his doctor, I want to sleep for a billion years. Stupendous issues are unfolding before our eyes, yet we are only specks of dust that have settled in the night on the map of the world. The myth which, uh, and the vision which Churchill invoked, is, it's centuries old, but it's there all right. It's there all right, and, and politicians can, they're very nervous of it. They're, they're like people who don't want to, um, like alcoholics who don't want to open a bottle, you know, full of fear, they, they, because they'll change, and they become captivated by it, just as so many who have drawn on it too deeply, or drunk from it too deeply, do get, uh, disoriented and uh, derationalized. Land of hope and glory, mother of the free. Land of hope and glory, mother of the free. How can I see it? How can we extol thee? Who are born of thee? Brighter yet and brighter shall thy bounds be set. God that made thee mighty, make thee mightier yet. God that made thee mighty, repeat repetition this, make thee mightier yet. I think that's it. That how shall we? That's the thing that's here me. That's here. How shall we extol thee? Mm. What does it make you feel of when you hear that sort of music? Oh, it always gives me a good feeling, yes. <laughs> 